here. The little boy says, Grandpa, you said your favorite animal is a kumquat. Oh, my God. Grandma took me to the grocery <laughs> store and showed me a kumquat. And he puts one in his hand and says, this is a kumquat, and it's not an animal. It's a fruit. And so he says, did I say kumquat? My mistake. I meant to say my favorite animal is a rutabaga. In the Bible, the word fruit has a number of different meanings. <clears throat> Jesus tells us, for instance, how to know false prophets. Uh, let, let's read uh, that from Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. If the thing's going to produce nasty fruit, you're taking up room and you get rid of it, burn it, pull it out, and plant something there that'll help contribute to your income. We'll look at the back of this uh, later in the lesson. talk a little bit about what the Bible says about bearing fruit. The first time it mentions it is in Genesis 1.11. In the most common way, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Yeah. And the second time it mentions it, same chapter, verse 22. Let's read that. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let thou multiply in the earth. Similar to a tree bearing fruit after its kind, animals and creatures bearing young after their kind. Then we're going to look at more spiritual applications of, of, of the use of that word fruit. The mission of the apostles. I don't know that I usually think of the mission of the apostles in terms of fruit. Jesus did. John 15, 16. Let's read that. You, you apostles, apostles have not, not chosen, chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Let's pause there a moment. That your fruit should remain. Did everybody who listened to the apostles and became Christians, did they all stay Christians? No. They didn't. But can you and I partake of the fruit of the Apostles' mission today? We can read about their mission. We can read their written word. We can read their wisdom about how to live as a Christian and so forth. So their fruit did remain, didn't it? So it must not mean only that Jesus was saying, you apostles, get out there 
and get busy and make people Christians and you make them stay Christians or you haven't done your job. Because it doesn't match the Bible. Can't mean that. Paul, remember, talked with the elders at Ephesus after him. My departure, grievous wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. The flock was the church members. He said, you feed the flock over the which the Lord has made you overseers. It happened time and time again. But their overall mission remained. John 20, verse 21, let's read that. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be to you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So let's go back a minute, you know. Did everyone that Jesus talked to become a follower of Jesus? And no. They were those who crucified yeah. They certainly didn't become followers of Christ. There were lots of people, it's difficult when you read in John, when Jesus comes to Jerusalem for the last time, apparently crowds are in the street, it's, a, it's a, one of the occasions, you know, and he's talking with this group, and he's talking with that group, and he's talking with the Pharisees, and then he's talking with this group. And, and some of them are saying, well, wait a minute, isn't this the one, isn't this the Messiah? And somebody else is saying, can a man do what he's doing if he's not the Messiah? And then the Pharisees or Sadducees would come and ask him questions that they thought would expose him as not really being the Christ. But he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And he said, you you're go out and bear fruit, and then it make sure it, it remains. Well, can a person become a Christian today? Can a person be saved today? Yes. Is there a church today? Yes. Has the mission of Christ failed? No. Does it fruit remain? Yes. And so does the fruit of the apostles. Number four, fruit is the results of learning God's true will. Before we read that, think about this. When I taught, I always talked with the children at the academy about the difference between memorizing something so they could repeat it back <laughs> even if they didn't understand a word of it and making something part of their working knowledge I said if you make if you learn something make it part of your working knowledge then it will operate in the just choices you make throughout each day and each week of your life if you just memorize some stuff so that you can get a teacher off your back or something, the next time you look, that, there'll be nothing there. I used to kid him that when memorizing for tests like that was like those um, skeletons sometimes they used to have in the doctor's office back in the old days. And there was these little, little hinges here and here and you could take it up and see the brain. And I said, you go home, you memorize the test, you go, home, you open it up, you bend over, you shake it out, get all that empty, so that you can have some more memorize and stick in there. I said, you're not learning, you're learning how to memorize, and you're proving that you can forget. But what you learn, what I learn, becomes part of me, becomes part of the who that I am. So, when we say the results of learning God's true will, let's read this from 1 Corinthians, I mean, Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Let's read that together. The truth of the gospel 
which has come to you as it is in all the world and brings forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth as you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Turn the page and face two. That you might walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Oh, wait a minute. So if I get the gospel in me good and I learn it, you mean it can help me be long suffering? It can help me be patient. It can help me have spiritual joy. It can help me have the kind of fruit good works that God wants me to have in good works. And I'll be filled with the knowledge of God and wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's way different than I memorized the Ten Commandments and passed the test on them. And I can probably remember five of them now. His prayer has to do with the truth of the gospel. And that was what Epaphras was teaching them. And Paul was praying that it would get in them and change the who that they were. Change the way they thought. Change the way they acted. And make it acceptable unto God. Number five. Fruit is the results of living by spiritual nature. Living by spiritual nature. The results of that, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Let's read that. But the spiritual nature produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their corrupt nature along with its evil passions and desires. If we intend to live by our spiritual nature, then the way we live needs to conform to that spiritual nature, see, that gives us the fruit of the Spirit. And that affects the choices I make every day and the way I treat people and the way I think about people. Even, you know, the way I think about wicked people. It affects the way I think about the laws. It affects the way I think about myself and my own struggles. Because I want, my, I want to be a spiritually based person, not a physically based person. So I can't express myself only in outward physical ways. I, I used to think about this. If you think, maybe you know people that whenever you think about them, you only think about their appearance, 
the way they want to look in their cars and their clothes and their makeup or their hair or whatever. And that's what they talk about all the time. I, I have a niece out in Texas that was that way growing up. If you sat at the table, other people might talk about this and that, but she only and ever talked about the way somebody looked or the way she looked. That's all she ever seemed to think about. And she had a lot of problems before she kind of got her mind straightened out from that. Um, I think it's in his, my brother's daughter, one of his daughters. Five B. The results of living by spiritual nature is being born of God's wisdom. James three seventeen and eighteen. Let's read that. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Does not make a good situation comedy for television, does it? They seem to be based upon people saying snide and ugly things about other people. You know? And then they come in with a canned laughter. Boy, that was funny. Uh, the wisdom from above. Now, that, that's not the wisdom that I get if I get a college education. It's not the wisdom I get if I self-study and become oh, the ultimate philosopher. It's a wisdom that comes from God. And as a lot of people can quote a lot of scripture, <laughs> they don't have any wisdom from God. The wisdom of God is going to be, make me pure, peaceable, gentle, easily entreated merciful, have good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and it's sown in peace of them that make peace. Jesus said, blessed is the, are the peacemakers. Number six. Fruit is the result of obeying God's will. There are essentially People trying to do good, but they just, they don't have it in them to obey. They just got an issue with an authority that they just think authority is wrong. No matter who has it, they would complain about it, you know. Ephesians 5, 9 and 10. It, it, We've got those two verses here. Let's read them. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. What is acceptable to the Lord. If I'm not looking at the Word of God from the standpoint of learning what's acceptable to God, what am I learning from it? It's like that fellow, I've mentioned it before. He was so proud that where he was going to church, they were studying real deep in the Old Testament. And I said, well, that's interesting. What did you learn last time? He said, we learned that women lived in separate tents. I didn't say anything. I don't know, what moral lesson? <laughs> <laughs> what moral lesson am I going to take from that? And you know where they learned it? They didn't learn it in the Bible. They learned it in the man's book who insisted he had studied history. And history said they 
those kinds of people live separate. Hence, <laughs> men and women. Oh my. Well. Wonder what Abraham would have thought. I don't know. Page three. The results of obeying God's will in the church. This would take some, you know, X amount of study, but these are the kinds of things that we study a lot. These are all taken from the book of Ephesians, and in the book of Ephesians, after you get to about verse 17, or, I'm sorry, verse 12 of chapter 4, it's talking about how each of different groups of people should live. Actions in the church, by church people, how they live at home and in their jobs and whatever, include the desire to help others find the gospel, certainly. Verses 12 through 16 would demonstrate that. We'll not take the time to go, that's an interesting thing to read these passages. And verses 17 through 24 talk about life in general and things that we should and shouldn't do. Verses 25 through 32 talk about specific actions. In chapter 5, the first 17 verses, more specific actions. So all these actions are either obeying God or doing what we want to do. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 talks about worshiping God. Think about the people who say, oh yeah, I, 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 I'm saved. I, 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 when I was 16, I confessed Christ as my Savior. Don't go to church, don't read the Bible, don't pray. Mm -hmm. They don't worship God. Why not? God fearing people worship God. Mm -hmm. right. Verses 22 through 32 talk about the relationship between husbands and wives, arguably when both are Christians. Mm -hmm. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 talk about parents and children. Ideal situation, but see, our challenge as Christians is this is what we would like to do, and then life happens. You know, you've had the flu for two weeks, and then the kids get it, and they're sick, and they're whining and crying, and they're miserable, and and your husband doesn't understand, and you know. And you're getting fusses with them, that's life. You know? Does that mean we don't want to do these things? I don't think it means that. I just think it means life is hard. And it gives us a place to go back to. You know? In chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, even talks about obligations of Christian slaves and Christian masters, which we could interpret today as Christian workers and Christian bosses. Mm -hmm. And number seven, fruit is the results of our actions and words. <laughs> mm -hmm. And instead of Psalm 1, you have Proverbs 1, 22 through 33. So we'll read Proverbs 1, 22 through 33 on the back of this sheet. Plain talk from the wisdom of God. Proverbs 1, uh, 22 through 33. Let's begin. How long will you gullible people love being so gullible? 
How long will you mockers find joy in your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Turn to me when I warn you. I will generously pour out my spirit for you. I will make my words known to you. I called, but you refused to listen. I stretched out my hands to you, and no one paid attention. You ignored all my advice. You did not want me to warn you. God's wisdom will laugh at your calamity. I will make fun of you when panic strikes you. When panic strikes you like a violent storm, when calamity strikes you like a windstorm, when trouble and anguish come to you, they will call to me at that time, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They refused my advice. They despised my every morning. They will eat the fruit of their lifestyle. They will be stuffed with their own schemes. Gullible people kill themselves because of their turning away. Fools destroy themselves because of their indifference. But whoever listens to me will live without worry and will be free from the dread of disaster. It had an interesting thing toward the end of that reading that people who despise the wisdom of God will be filled with the fruit of their own way. They won't be guided into the spiritual fruit of God. So what is going to bear fruit in their life is the choices they make without the wisdom of God. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't care about them. It means that God's wisdom will mock them because he made it available to them and they chose not to hear it. They chose not to take any wisdom from God. So then here, then, uh, let's read Psalm 1, back on page 3 here. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So, in addition to being filled with their own fruit, the tragedy is that their way will perish. They cut themselves off from the love of God, cut themselves off from the Savior. Mm -hmm. um, they cut themselves off from the fruit of the Spirit that can change their life. Page four. The fruiting of a tree. 
may change due to its conditions. Our ability to bear fruit is also affected by how much of our time and ability is taken simply by laboring to survive, having small children to deal with, job changes, changes to health, aging, and so forth. I think that makes sense that at different times in our lives, different things restrict us or give us opportunities but, you know, within that, if we're practicing and learning the wisdom of God, if we're trying to yield the fruit of the Spirit, it will appear in, in most of those different stages of our lives. Mm -hmm. Thinking about fruit, there's the fruit of trees and of creatures, you know, and the apostles had a mission to bear lasting spiritual fruit. Then in Christians, fruit is results. Results of learning God's true will. Results of living by spiritual nature. Results of obeying God's will. Results of our actions and words. As we learn more of God's true will from His Word, we live more by our spiritual natures. We seek to obey His will in all things. The results of our actions and words change. The fruit of our lives will grow more spiritual. Thanks be to God. When years ago, I don't remember just when, it's a lot of years ago, 30, 35, 40. I went to work for 7 Eleven and uh, they had me take some tests and moved me up to a, a supervisor. And you remember that was the year that Heather was born? I used to bring her to the shop with me. Yeah, well, this was the second time that I lived, worked for him. Anyway, um, I was to train with another man who had been a supervisor, and we would ride around in a car together so he could show me what a supervisor did, you know. For, or two, something like that, you know. And during that time, he, he talked to me. He said, my life is just such a horrible mess. He says, I just don't even know what to do. And he had made bad choices sexually with store employees and things like that. And stood to lose his wife of many years and he was eating the fruit, if you would, of his own way. And what he wanted was some magic <laughs> magic pill that he could take this and it would straighten everything out, you know. The one thing that he needed to do, he wouldn't do. He would he wouldn't go to church, study God's word give it all up and get right with God regardless of what happened with all that other stuff. He couldn't pay that price. After a while I lost track of him, but that's a, it's a sad thing. People get so bound up with the fruit that they've already borne that bad fruit that they can't see that there's only one path. Yet there's all kind of examples in the Bible of people who had made bad choices and had to give it up for God and then live right. And how God then blessed them.
as we learn more of God's true will from His Word, we live more by our spiritual nature. We seek to obey His Word in all things. Now then, the results of our actions and words change because our actions and words themselves change. And the fruit of our spirit will grow more spiritual. The fruit of our lives will be more spiritual. And, and that's a cause for thanksgiving to God. James 3.18 says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Number 23 has been selected as an invitation song. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we ask that you make your needs known while we stand together and sing. Someday I'm going to heaven, beautiful city somewhere. Someday I'm going to together and then we'll have George lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdoms come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again we thank you for giving us this day and allowing us to gather here in your house of worship to sing you songs of praise and worship you in spirit and in truth. Once again, thank you, dear Lord, for allowing Brother Ed to be with us this morning to guide us in the teaching and understanding of your word. We pray that today's lesson has renewed and strengthened our spirit and our faith and has increased our knowledge and will be a help to us to become, to become better Christians. We pray the Lord that as we depart from here, <clears throat> that you will watch over us and keep us under your protection, that you will also watch over and protect those that are dear to us, our families, our loved ones and friends, that you will keep us safe and healthy, and that if it is your will, the Lord, that you will, <clears throat> you will allow us to once again gather here on the next Lord's Day. We pray the Lord that we will always strive to live our lives in a manner that is according to your word and pleasing in your sight. And we pray that we can inspire others to seek you out through our actions and deeds. We thank you, the Lord, for <clears throat> providing for our needs and for all of the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. We know that you hear our prayers, the Lord, and that if it is your will, it will be done. Thank you most of all for the sacrifice made by your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the remission of our sins to give us that avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, amen.